edition of Terra Verde, a weekly environment program co-hosted by Earth Island Journal and KPFA and broadcast on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host and producer for today, Zoe loftus Farron. The costs of war are devastating and far-reaching. There's the loss of life, the displacement of families, the impact to physical and mental health, there are the financial costs, and though it may not always be the first to come to mind, there's also the cost to the environment. Whether it's Russia's war in Ukraine or Ethiopia's civil war, or the United States recently ended a war in Afghanistan, armed conflict can wreak havoc on nature, including on protected landscapes, essential waterways, vulnerable wildlife, and much more. On top of that, military action has major implications for the climate. Here with us today to discuss the many environmental impacts of war and armed conflict is Andrea Nazarino, a political writer for the publication Tom Dispatch. Andrea, welcome to Terra Verde. Thank you very much for having me. I wanted to um, start by asking you to tell us a bit about your background and, and how you came to work in this area um, of assessing kind of the cost of war. Sure. In 2011, with uh, some social science colleagues at Brown University's Watson Institute for International Studies, I co-founded the Cost of War Project, which is a project of scholars and activists and doctors um, who study the ongoing costs of war, um, primarily the human costs. Um, I'm also a military spouse of over 10 years, so I experienced some of those costs firsthand. And I am a clinical social worker working um, in large part with military and refugee populations. Thank you. So, you know, as I kind of mentioned, there are, there are some costs of war that aren't quite as obvious as others, and perhaps one of those um, is the carbon footprint of military action. Can you talk about some of the ways that war contributes directly to, to global warming? Sure. Military vehicles uh, like tanks and aircraft carriers, they emit a very large amount of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, nitrous oxide, and sulfur dioxide. Just our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001 um, have caused hundreds of thousands of tons of these gases to be released into the environment in those countries. So that one, one issue is the release of, of greenhouse gases that contribute to a warming planet and the pollution of local environments. Um, war also means that Forests need to be clear-cut to build refugee camps um, and camps for displaced persons, um, many of which are powered by um, generators fueled by oil. Um, so there's another multiplying climate effect of war. Um, wars mean that water sources in local environments are contaminated by um, a depleted uranium from ammunition and from oil that seeps out from military vehicles. Uh, and war means that existing efforts made by cities like Mariupol in Ukraine, for example, um, to invest in energy, clean water pollution, those efforts are turned back or many, many years or altogether destroyed because the infrastructure in those cities no longer functions. Uh, so those are some of the effects of war. There are you know, public health effects like the burn pits uh, that the U.S. military established in Iraq to incinerate garbage. Um, we're seeing um, claims um, with the VA um, that is exponentially uh, related to lungs among veterans from those pits. So that those are just an, a number of ways that war affects the environment. But a, a big way is just through the vast amount um, and dioxide and other emissions that military vehicles emit. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned a few of these already, but I'm, I'm wondering if, if we think 
you know, specifically about the war in Ukraine right now, if there are a few um, particular examples that, that come to mind about the environmental toll? Well, one, one other example would be that since Russia invaded eastern Ukraine in 2014, uh, that region, um, like Donetsk and Luhansk, has been forced to turn to lower-grade coal to power its energy needs as opposed to getting cleaner energy from Kiev um, because of the Russian-backed separatists who have been, who have cut ties with the capital. So some of the political divisions fostered by war mean that countries turn to lower-grade, um, more polluting energy sources. Um, and that's happening right now as we speak in, in EU countries. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know we're, we're seeing um, European countries changing plans around coal phase-outs, for example, right now. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, so I, I also wanted to kind of look at this in, a, in an intersectional way, and I wonder if, if you can talk a little bit about um, how war can really compound threats to certain populations. It seems that some of those groups that are the most vulnerable to, to war and armed conflict are also, in many cases, the most vulnerable to climate change. Sure. Well, many, if not the majority, of those left behind today in Ukrainian cities, besides those who have joined the military and the resistance, are older people uh, and people with disabilities. Uh, and the reasons for that are, some of those reasons are obvious, that it's harder for those groups to flee, but the reason that's true is because infrastructure, um, such as buses and trains, um, are behind, is behind in terms of um, being accessible to people with disabilities and older people. Human Rights Watch has done a lot of great work on that. Um, and that means that those populations who are left behind in war zones are subject directly to the water pollution and the air pollution caused by um, attacks and military vehicles. And that might um, also extend to, to children and other vulnerable groups, I, I would assume. Of course, yes. Um, so right now, you know, Ukraine is on a lot of minds, but of course, it's not the only armed conflict occurring right now or, or recently. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, there's any reliable way to kind of calculate or conceptualize the total environmental costs of, of ongoing conflicts across the globe. Is that something that you've thought about at all? I've thought about that, but I think that that would fall into an area for future research. I mean, we don't think enough as a global population about the total environmental costs of war. Um, I could say that a single military mission, a single air mission to bomb, you know, a site, one site can release up to a thousand metric tons of uh, of carbon dioxide. Um, the U.S. Department of Defense, um, if it were a country, it would rank about 55th in the world um, in terms of annual emissions of carbon dioxide. Um, so just to put that in perspective, um, that's greater than some developed countries like Portugal and Sweden, for example. Um, so it's safe to say that war is a major, that war in our preparations for it is a major contribution to global warming, but I don't know of attempts to quantify that in the aggregate globally. Is there any other kind of specific research you think would be useful as we, as we think about the intersection of, of war and the environment? I think that... Um, Iraqi doctors and social scientists 
um, some of which, some of whom are are affiliated with the Cost of War Project, like Leif Mullah Hussein, for example, have done some really important localized research on how war has impacted um, the local environment from the perspective of healthcare. Um, for example, how doctors' ability to treat cancer um, in those regions have been impacted by, for example, the contamination of local water sources and lack of <laughs> lack of access to electricity. Um, I also think that those those local practitioners and activists have have highlighted a need for more in-depth research into how um, depleted uranium that is leached into local water sources has impacted certain rates of cancer in Iraq and other countries that the war on terror, um, as well as an increase in infections. Um, Human Rights Watch is another group that has done some really good work on um, war and the environment in Iraq. For example, um, when a report came out on contamination of water sources in Basra, Iraq, and how that's impacted a surge in infections um, by contaminating, by, by sort of acting against water treatment. Um, so, so those are some sources I can think of. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I, my knowledge on that topic is limited. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to remind everyone that I'm Zoe loftus Farron, and you're tuned in to Terra Verde. Um, today, we're discussing the environmental impacts of war with Andrea Mazzarino, a political writer with the publication Tom Dispatch. Um, so jumping um, to a you know, slightly different but related topic, we know that here in, in the U.S., the Department of Defense has a really big um, carbon footprint. Can you speak to that at all and what that comes from? Well, right now, the, war, the U.S. is a presence in over 80 countries around the world, and that's just its counterterrorism presence since 2001. Uh, in other words, that's where we arm local troops. It's where we fight. It's where we have bases. It's where we have prisons, and it's where we operate intelligence. And that means that the Pentagon, with its large energy expenditure, is contributing environmental degradation in those countries many of which are already vulnerable because they're not fully developed. Um, so countries like Nigeria, for example. Um, thank you. And are there, are there efforts to kind of address this carbon footprint and, and reduce it right now? So the military does have, um, or at least, Separate branches of the military have their own strategic plans um, to combat um, the effects of, of their activities on climate change, but those plans remain aspirational, and I am not aware of anything um, actually in practice that has made a significant dent in our military's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so there's also, I think, a flip side to this discussion, which is that um, researchers believe that in many cases climate change will increase the incidence of, of conflict, um, at least in certain places. Can you can you talk about that a bit? Well, I think climate change is thought about as a threat multiplier by many in the environmental and and national security fields. Um, For example, it's projected by scientists that if we continue at our current rate of, um, if if the world continues at its current rate of global warming and consumption, um, we will see 
severe water shortages for half of the global population annually, which will in turn likely result in conflicts over basic resources that human beings need for our survival. So it follows that shortages like water shortages and food shortages, which will also exponentially increase if we keep at the rate that we are, um, will lead to, to fighting over access to those resources and refugee flows um, and for refugee flows to increase, which is already happening um, at our southern border um, and elsewhere around the world. And, you know, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but I'm wondering if you could go into a bit more detail. Um, you know, countries experiencing war and conflict like, say, Ukraine right now um, are likely to have a particularly hard time dealing with the impacts of, of climate change and adapting. Um, does that ring true to you? It does. Uh, well, just, just look at cities like Mariupol um, and Severodonetsk in, in Ukraine where residents have been reduced to a fight for their survival by burning firewood to cook food um, and to shelter from extreme temperatures. If, if you live in a war zone, your access to air conditioning and heat and clean water um, is that much more compromised. So, in effect, war at a local level multiplies the effects of climate change that already are upon us. And um, do you think that we're going to start seeing more attention paid to kind of the intersection of these issues? I don't know. I, I thought so <laughs> at the beginning of this year when Build Back Better in the fall was still up for a vote, but um, perhaps not surprisingly, we, um, you know, we, we killed a bill that could have been paid for several times over had we not been at war um, for the past 20 years, 20 plus years in this country. So I would think that something so urgent that is already affecting us um, all around the world would receive more attention than it has. But I am losing hope that we have the political will to do that uh, at a global level. Mm -hmm. What about, say, among nonprofits or, or aid organizations? Um, are you noticing or are you hopeful about seeing some kind of um, uptick as far as documenting the environmental costs of conflict or, or even mitigating them or, or addressing conflict more generally? Um, I think that where we will see change is at the local level. I think that um, organizations, um, NGOs and also local governments um, are going to play a decisive role in making environments habitable um, in some areas, but, but, but not in others. And I think that efforts like, you know, projects, local government projects to plant more native plants, um, to invest in green energy, um, in, for example, cities like Mariupol before we went to war, um, are very promising, um, but I think that, that it's going to be efforts taken to avert like the larger scale disaster scientists from the UN have been warning about now for years. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in your like in your work with the Cost of War project, what have you found to be some of the biggest challenges as far as documenting costs? including on, you know, the human um, toll. The biggest challenges in documenting costs, like the human toll, have been government obfuscation of information. I mean, the U.S. Mm -hmm. the U.S. does not keep consistent records of civilian death tolls. Um, the, the measurements uh, of who is a civilian and, and what has, uh, what constitutes a civilian casualty 
have changed from administration to administration. Journalists haven't been consistently granted access to war zones. And the Pentagon has consistently hidden from public view um, what hundreds of records it does have about um, civilian casualties and broader effects like infrastructure destroyed from its, its own operations abroad. So I think that it's, it's been a real struggle um, just to get what you would think are, are basic numbers like, like, like people killed um, from direct combat. Um, although the cost of war project has, and it's been a, it's been a long, long project, but we have. What is less known to us is the kind of uh, kinds of problems you and I are talking about today, which are indirect costs from war, such as um, illness, malnutrition, and injury from environments that have been destroyed, um, roads that have been bombed out, water that's been contaminated. Uh, we don't know about those things because um, the smoke hasn't cleared, and once the smoke does clear, it would be a very complicated undertaking to understand just how many people have been killed by the indirect environmental cost of war. Um, so that that's a project that needs to happen, but it hasn't yet. That um, leads into another question of mine, which is, you know, about how much we can know in real time and, and, and how, how we gather information either in, in real time or after. Um, can you speak to that at all? I think one of the key ways we gather information in real time is through the hard work and courage of journalists and activists who live in war zones. Um, an example that first comes to mind is Ishan Usmani, um, a scholar activist who founded Pakistan Body, Pakistan Body Count, um, which tracks civilian casualties in, in his home country um, from the U.S. war on terror. He's been a tremendous resource, same with uh, Iraq body count, um, and with numerous journalists uh, like Omar Gawachi, for example, who have, who have tracked the cost of war from the ground. Um, obviously, they do so at great cost to their lives, but they're indispensable so that people know just how dire the decision to solve a problem through war is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where, for any listeners who are really interested in, in learning more um, about the intersection, of, about, well, about the cost of war generally and about um, the intersections with the environment, what are some other organizations or resources that you might suggest? Well, first I would send people to the cost of war project at Brown. Um, watson.brown.edu slash cost of war. Um, that would be a tremendous resource um, because there's you know about 40 scholars there and counting who are doing research in, of various sorts on the cost of war. Um, I think that any one of the scholars in that project um, has a great deal uh, to offer in terms of expertise on human and financial and environmental costs of war. Um, I think that um, other, other particular um, scholars I, I would, that come to mind include Professor um, David Vine, um, who is um, a professor of political anthropology at American University in D.C., um, he, he writes about refugee issues and other human costs of war. Um, human Rights Watch is doing a great deal of wonderful work on the cost of war to human rights. Um, so those are just a few that come to mind, but that's by no means an exhaustive list. Mm -hmm. And um, are there any other, like, examples of... Um, even outside of Ukraine, a few more examples of the local kind of cost of war to the environment before we, before we wrap up that you might take us through? 
Well, one cost of war to the environment that I haven't mentioned is the local cost of war in the United States. Um, military cities and towns um, like Colorado Springs, for example, home to several bases, um, are they, they experience environmental costs every day in the form of increased carbon emissions, air pollution, um, and, and then also sort of the human environmental costs of the UIs from stressed out um, soldiers and veterans um, and, and in increased incidences of, of, of family-based violence um, in and around military bases. Um, so those that that would be an environmental cost of war that mm -hmm. I would urge people to think about. Um, that that would be something that I would uh, I would mm -hmm. I would really encourage people to take a look at. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't um, thought about that dimension, and I, I imagine as a military spouse, as you mentioned, you've seen some of that um, firsthand. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today's show. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, I want to thank our team at KPFA for everything that they do and our sound engineer, Peter. Um, and I want to remind people that this show and others are available online at kpfa.org for your listening convenience. You can find Andrea's writing at tomdispatch.com, and you can also um, learn more about the cost of war at um, Brown University's Cost of War program. Thank you again, and have a nice Thank weekend, you. everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. KPFA is America's original, listener-supported radio station. Yes, we're the place on the dial that speaks truth to power, but we're also a music discovery platform. Music is part of the genetics of KPFA. We connect Bay Area music lovers to genres that inspire creativity. Help us continue to share the magic of jazz, blues, rock, funk, R&B, gospel, world, and classical music by making a donation at kpfa.org. Do you want to know what's going on around KPFA? On the Deck is the monthly video announcement series hosted by me, Miko Tolliver, where I give you program updates, info on our live events calendar, and interviews about show hosts and station history. Visit the front page of our station website at www.kpfa.org and stay current on all things KPFA.